Um, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'd like to talk to you about the General Data Protection Regulation, which is a new privacy regulation that is coming into effect in Europe on May 25th, which is eight days from today. And associated with it, one of the things that has changed is that this regulation really has teeth. And there are um, steep fines up to 20 million euros or 4% of your annual revenue, whichever is larger, if you're violating this regulation. So that has, of course, companies very concerned, and it, said, and it has made privacy a board issue for many organizations. And some privacy professionals also believe that when we wake up on May 26, we're waking up in a different world, and they're very nervous and interested what the first enforcement actions are going to be against companies that might be violating GDPR. So although GDPR, um, the regulation itself, applies to the countries of the EEA, the European Economic Area, which are the 28 EU countries, plus Norway, Iceland, and um, Liechtenstein, the impact of the GDPR is global. And the reason is that it does not, if you're a company that is processing European data, even if you're not located in the EU itself, you still have to comply with the law. So that affects, of course, many US companies, like my own, like Intertrust. And it also affects many Japanese companies who have been working, many of them tirelessly, for the last year or so in order to implement uh, a, a transformation to become GDPR compliant. So, strictly speaking, a company only needs to be compliant with the, um, for the European data that they're processing, but many organizations choose to be compliant to apply the GDPR principles to all of the data they're processing. And the reason they're doing it is because it's costly to have do two different privacy management regimes. That is the first reason. And the second one is that um, also from a reputational perspective, it can be quite problematic if you process, for example, European data better than American data. This happened to Facebook, where in the um, American media, people were wondering if Facebook users from America were now second-class citizens because European users had better protections than, than the Americans had. And um, then Mark Zuckerberg came out and said, no, no, we're making these privacy protections available globally. So there are various reasons for um, that companies want to apply these principles, not just to their European data holdings, but also to others. So in this talk, I want to talk about the impact of GDPR, give a quick overview what some of the key um, provisions are, the opportunities that arise from that, and then talk about how that influences technology. And I look at this from two angles. So the first angle is technologies that help you to implement GDPR in your organization, that help you comply. And the second one is how these privacy rules apply to products, let's say, that you're building and that you're selling, which also need to be GDPR compliant. So that's a, a, uh, the issue of privacy by design, and then finish with a few predictions. So, here are some of the key changes that are coming through the GDPR. So the first one is that there's a highly broadened definition of personal data. And that includes not just name, email, a phone number, and so on, but also now online identifiers and pseudonymous data. So that puts a number of um, processes and products are now covered under the privacy regulation that previously weren't. So for example, um, if your, if your technology produces online identifiers or di device identifiers or, of, or user identifiers, then potentially your technology may be um, affected by GDPR, which it previously was not necessarily. <coughs> so the next thing is that every processing of uh, personal data requires a lawful basis. And that means that you, for every processing, if you don't have one of six reasons, um, that are given in the law, you can't process the data. And the most important ones for companies are um, consent, performance of a contract, and, and the third one is a legitimate interest of the company itself, which is narrowly defined. 
Then GDPR ups the um, consent requirements, so the standard is very high. So consent needs to be uh, freely given, it needs to be specific. It, there can be a vague consent like saying, oh, you can use my data for any kind of online advertising or so. That is no longer permissible. And it requires affirmative action by the user and opt-in. Many organizations now also need a DPO, a data protection officer, and uh, the IPP, the International Association of Privacy Professionals, has determined that worldwide about 70,000 DPOs are going to be needed. And according to their computations in the US, I believe it's 9,000 that are needed. And in Japan, they determined it is 1,688 um, data protection officers are needed. And of course, there is a great shortage of skilled people at this moment in privacy. There's also data breach notification requirements. So if you have a serious breach of personal data, you need to notify person, um, regulatory authorities or even users within, within 72 hours, which is quite challenging. And there is an expanded list of user rights, the right, for example, the right to access the information that a, that a company has about you, the right to be forgotten so that Im information can be deleted about you, and also the right for data portability, that you can take the data that you provided to a company, can ask for it to receive it back in a machine-readable format, and carry it on and give it to some uh, to another party, which is there to encourage competition. So these are some of the provisions, and they're often very challenging to implement for organizations. So nevertheless, they are not just challenges. They're also opportunities that I want to talk about. And what are some of the opportunities that come out of GDPR? So the first one is that users can now take back control over their data. So organizations can't just share them anymore. They need to have the permission or consent or another law for reasons. Users can track organizations down. You could go to an organization and ask, which data do you have about me? Um, and then the organization has to respond within 30 days. And then you can ask for those information to be deleted. So you, users have get a lot more control back. Companies get the opportunity to develop trusted relationships with consumers. Because companies, in order to process data, they often need the consumer's opt-in, their consent. However, to get that consent, consumers need to trust that company. So that, that's why um, being a trusted company is going to be a commercial distinguisher, more so than it has been before. The third thing is that there are specific requirements for technology in the GDPR. There is privacy by design is a requirement. You need to build privacy protections into any product, for example, that you build from the beginning. And that means also that I think technology is now going to include much more privacy enhancing technologies, tools, and uh, processes um, that will make it a lot better from a data protection perspective than it was before. So, now I want to talk about three types of technologies that help you to implement GDPR. And the first one is, in, is uh, technologies for the privacy office. So this is um, some of the GDPR requirements are about accountability. And if you're an organization in Japan, you may have to comply with GDPR. You might find these tools useful. Or even if you are not, if you don't have to comply, because GDPR provides such an excellent framework for privacy, you may choose to voluntarily adopt some of these provisions. And I understand that also the Japanese um, Data Protection Authority has issued some guidance on GDPR and so on. So I know J Japan has also been very involved in making sure that the privacy principles applied here are uh, comparable with what's happening in Europe, and that or at least strong enough that data can flow freely from Europe to Japan and vice versa. So three tools that I want to mention here. One is assessment. Imagine you're in a large organization where there are thousands of projects going on per year that touch personal data. Each of these projects under the accountability requirement, you should evaluate if there are potential privacy issues. That is very difficult to do this with personnel or to do it with, you know, word questionnaires. So one of the one family of tools that is becoming popular now is, a is our privacy assessment tools, where you can intelligently ask 
um, uh, new um, projects, for example, to go through an assessment and to, that tool will then flag up any possible privacy risks. And I've be, I, I like these tools. I built such a tool about 10 years ago when I was working for HP, where we exactly had this problem of um, thousands of projects that needed to be in an accountable way reviewed for privacy. And I was in HP Labs, and we were working on creating this decision support tool that could be used in order to automatically evaluate all these projects. The knowledge base had about 1,000 rules. We had 300 questions, and the questions were dynamically generated so that an average project had about 40 questions to answer. So at the time, we didn't commercialize it, but now um, there's become a real market for it because GDPR is asking for it. But GR, um, HP at the time rule, rolled this out globally across its whole organization and 300,000 employees at the time. So that's the first set of tools, privacy assessments, very useful. What I don't like about the new tools, given I've built one myself before, is that the knowledge base that underlies them is not very good. So if you ever think about these tools, that's something I would look for, that really you get good questionnaires and and and... Uh, good content in there because else if it's just very generic it is not very helpful. The next thing that GDPR requires you is to have a data inventory and that means that um, you need to catalog all the personal data that you have in your organization together with certain attributes for example the lawful purpose, um, the lawful basis under which you're processing it, data retention periods and all these kind of things. You need to have all this in an organized way. The regulator could come in and could request to see it. And data inventory tools helps with us. I've been using one now myself, and I find it incredibly helpful. Next one is the data subject rights that I mentioned. For example, that you can contact a company, access your data, correct your data, delete your data. That is, again, a managerial difficulty for many organizations. So there are also now tools out that help with that. So those are useful tools to look at. In terms of data security, GDPR doesn't say much. I mean, it requires data security, but it doesn't tell you much about which, which technologies to use. But it does explicitly mention two, and that is pseudonymization and encryption. In you know a data platform that we've used, that that we've built, we apply some of these principles. So we, when we receive personal data, we immediately pseudonymize it where we can. For example, email addresses in an online advertising context, we may hash these email addresses. At the same time, the original data are immediately encrypted, so and uh, secured and encrypted. And if we create, if we use user identifiers for, um, uh, um, for creating user profiles and so on, they never, they never contain the original PII, but only pseudonyms. Um, a, next, uh, a next good tool to use is privacy aware access control tools and we have been building this also with an European for European company we have been working closely with them in a in a privacy sensitive area and what we're doing there is that you can actually also access control policies and have privacy concepts co uh, concepts in mind so for example you can also a policy where you can say that certain parties can ans can access data about users except um, personally identifiable information and so on, and then the system knows what that means and can enforce that. So those are, for example, three tools that I think help can help with um, data security. There is another, uh, the third family I want to talk about is about consent management tools, which is something that we've also um, implemented to some extent, and there's also now a whole family of tools out there that are implementing it. And that is, they when you consent these days has to be specific. And that means that you have to have a, um, you need to store when a, user, when a user gave his consent, what he specifically consented to, how a user consented, if that was an opt-in or an opt-out or a double opt-in, the version of the privacy policy shown. So it is a whole, um, so you need to store for consent a whole object. And then you need the tool you need to support the collection of this specific consent from a website and the storage of the so detailed consent and the revocation, because a user needs to be able to revoke his consent at any time in an easy way. So there are also tools now that allow you to do that. Here there's also a standard from the Kantara initiative that is being developed that shows you this on the right side. And that's very important, because if you look at the online advertising system, these are all companies 
that collaborate when online ad ads are shown to users. On the right side are the consumers, then there are the publishers, the apps, and the websites. And then all these parties collaborate, and they share user data very often. So now, how can you make this an accountable process? How can you ensure that only where there is consent, the, um, the only those parties where the user has given consent do receive the data, and only those for those and use them for those purposes that the um, user has agreed to? This is a very difficult problem to solve. The IAB Europe, a trade, or, a trade organization for um, uh, the ad, uh, um, advertising industry, the online advertising industry, they created a solution for this. And it goes like fo as follows. I want to show you how it works. So they've created a central registry for all the ad tech companies. So they register with uh, the IAB Europe. Then a publisher is going to ask users for the purposes, that, which is a website or an app, is going to ask users for consent to sharing data with certain partners that the website, for example, is doing business with or likes to do business with. So they're disclosing it to the user, and they're asking the user for his consent, and also for certain purposes. And then these permissions are going to be encoded in a string. And whenever now a so the idea of this standard, whenever an advertising-related request is traveling through this ecosystem, for example, this string could be attached to the, um, to the request so that you understand the policy on how the data can be used. So that is their proposal. And here is an example of what that looks like. So you have the different uh, purposes above. So green means the user has agreed to all these purposes. You have the registered users below. Green means, again, the uh, companies that the user is willing to share its data with. Red means he's not willing. And then you encode this in the string. You first encode the purposes, and then the vendors whom the user is willing to share them with. And you can compress this string, which can then be used to communicate uh, the policy. And this can, for example, be then embedded in a web cookie. So if, you're, if an advertising company accesses a web cookie uh, about it, then it can, again, um, derive from that what the policy is according to which it can use this um, user's information. So now I want to talk about your products. So the first thing is about how technology can help you to meet your privacy requirements. The next thing is how can you create products that are compliant with GDPR? And one of the requirements that GDPR has is privacy by design. You have the basic idea is you have to build privacy into the, um, into the products early on when, you are, um, when you're building them. And how would you do that in, an, in a typical so, uh, traditional software development approach, in a waterfall approach, you have a requirements and design phase. In that phase, you could have a privacy review. You could identify any privacy risks, identify mitigations and then they could be implemented. However, that's um, today, in many, many times, we have agile development in uh, concepts are being used, where there is incre where there are incremental changes to functionality that are so consistently happening in sprints. And now this idea that you can have this one big privacy review and, and uh, determine what the privacy risks are and fix them is no longer working. So now the question is, how can you solve that from a practical perspective if you want your products to, that you build to be privacy compliant to be, uh, to, um, and to make sure that while incrementally the functionality changes, no bad things happen from a privacy perspective. How can you do that? And I think the best solution, and a few other people in the community think that as well, that the only way to do it is that instead of having the outside reviewers, you need to have, you need to have developers, privacy champions within the teams that are trained on privacy engineering, that are trained on detecting privacy risks, and um, they can then consistently, while the development process is happening, they then consistently can apply these good privacy engineering principles to the design, flag up risks, and perhaps when they notice that something is really too difficult for them, contact 
some specialists in the organization. So the solution that I would propose is that, you know, an, an, an agile development team needs a privacy engineering expert if it does privacy, if it um, provides privacy sensitive functionality. What are some of the things that um, people should uh, know that is included in privacy by design that um, a privacy engineer should know? So some first is data flow diagrams. So if you want to detect privacy risk, one of the best things you can do is to map out how data flows between different um, applications and components in your architecture and potentially also how it is being processed throughout the life cycle from collection up to deletion. So you want to you want to have a graphic representation of that and then you can look at all the different steps and analyze if there's a potential privacy risk. The next thing then that I think a privacy engineer should be should know learn, ab learn about is how to make a data protection impact assessment. So a data protection impact assessment means that you that you systematically review a new project for privacy risks. And when you've done that, you're going to identify, as usual, you identify the mitigations. And to meet the accountability requirements, you're also documenting. These are the risks you found. These are how, the, the, how you suggest to mitigate them. Here's how the mitigation was done. All of that together gives you an accountable process for your product development um, uh, um, that you have actually identified and addressed the privacy risks and solved, solved for them. Then there are certain technical things you should apply. One of them are data minimization principles. So you should ever always try to work with the minimum data possible, both at collection time and collected from the user, but also when you share it um, between different components in your architecture. You should only share the minimal one. Deploy um, pseudonymization techniques where possible. For online advertising, that's often enough, because if you have, for example, a hash of emails, you can still um, decide if two profiles, if they key, for example, a profile, you can still decide if it's the same profile based on the hash. You don't need the original information very often. So you should apply this data minimiza minimization principle throughout. Another thing that you can use is data aggregation. So only share the data that are really needed. And often this can only be, this doesn't need to be the original data, but aggregated data are sufficient. So those are all the types of things that you can apply to for the design. Another thing that you need to do to be compliant with GDPR in your privacy design is to um, implement uh, the user rights that I spoke about before. So how would you implement the data subject rights? How do you make it easy for the technology that you're building? So one thing that I already mentioned is consent management. You need to make sure you're collecting and storing consent in the right way and you're honoring the consent then downstream when data are being processed. Other data subjects rights are the right of access. So you, you could, for example, design um, a portal where a user can log in or where a user can access all the information you have about him and can potentially, if you want to allow for it, also correct this information or delete this information. Companies like um, uh, Facebook and Google have, uh, have, for example, done this. So this could become a very standard feature of um, uh, services you develop. Um, another important thing is um, limiting data retention. According to GDPR, you should only keep data for a limited period of time as long as it is necessary to have those data. So you should also build into um, in a best automated ways that data are deleted according to a schedule that you have defined. So these are some of the mechanisms that can be really helpful, I believe, for, um, for implementing privacy by design. So, now I want to give you and leave you perhaps with a few examples of technologies that actually are quite challenging from a GDPR perspective and where we need very innovative solutions. So, what, um, and I want to mention too, what is IoT and blockchain technologies. So for IoT, the situation is that you have many parties 
which are sharing data with each other. Um, it seems obvious that you need to have a very strict control about the purposes how this information can be used, because this information that is collected about you by your lights and by your refrigerator and by your car and so on, this information could be very sensitive in certain contexts, very privacy sensitive. So you need to very much limit and manage this information in ways that is compliant with, with the way um, that you have informed a user about. So you need to inform a user about the way how the data are going to be used. You need to receive the user's consent. And then you have to process the data accordingly. So the idea of having a data platform that, for example, implements these policies looks like a good one to me. However, GDPR presents also a number of very unique challenges. And that is that GDPR makes a distinction between a data processor and a data controller. A data controller is a party that determines the ways and the means of processing data. So they're often the decision maker what's happening to the data. The data processor is a party who operates on um, instruction from a data controller and just is only allowed to process the data in the way that the data controller tells them. So now, in this scenario, if you have a very distributed scenario where people sh are sharing data with each other, it is not clear who would be the data controller and who would be the data processor. However, these concepts are fundamentally important to the way that GDPR is applied. So we are already in the situation that we have a new law coming into effect next week, and we already know that for some technologies it will be very hard to use. Um, similarly, in, within this ecosystem, who has the responsibility to implement the data subject rights? That is also an open question, which, um, yeah. So I'm posing open, pr open problems. I don't necessarily suggest I have all the solutions for them. So these are some of the things that happen in the IoT space. In the blockchain space, even some European parliamentarians have noticed those that were actually working on um, uh, um, creating the GDPR and, and, and bringing it through the process that it actually became a regulation and a law, they have noticed that there were some contradictions between what the GDPR requires and how blockchain technology at least typically works. And the issue is that blockchains typically are used to ensure the immutability of the data that are being entered into the blockchain, that are being recorded in the blockchain. However, um, the GDPR, if these are personal data, there is a problem, because GDPR gives users the right to be forgotten. So data about them can be removed. So this is um, uh, a challenge. And I think there are technical solutions for it, and interesting technical solutions. But at least one needs to work on this problem, how how this is going to be implemented. And it is also, again, similar problems arise if you have a distributed um, organization instead of a trusted third party. You again get the, it gets the same questions as in IoT. Um, who, is going to be, who is going to be implementing the um, data subject rights, for example? So these are very challenging questions that are seeing blockchains that want to process personal data have to um, have to work through and come up with a solution. I mean, some of the solutions are probably could use cryptographic techniques, where instead of entering uh, um, data into the blockchain themselves, you enter you know certain um, hashes of these data and so on. So these techniques can be used. Perhaps you ha can you can use redaction techniques, things that you can um, enter data into a blockchain and then you can successively redact data from those that have been recorded without necessarily. So maybe some of these techniques could sometimes um, be helpful. OK, so the other problem is, again, who is the controller and who is the processor? So I want to end with a few predictions for privacy. And the first one is that the EU supervisory uh, supervisory authorities will 
enforce aggressively against companies that are going to willfully neglect the uh, willfully violate the uh, privacy principles laid out in the GDPR. So I'm, I'm fairly certain that is going to happen and we might see it fairly soon. So companies, also even large companies, have to be very concerned. There has been a lot of criticism, although Facebook, for example, has done things well. On some level they were saying they are um, uh, get, uh, operate, um, offering GDPR user rights to everybody around the world, but on the other hand, then people have looked at the implementation and they didn't do it very well, because the implementation, if you want to give users a real choice, in the implementation it was often so you had a big button to say yes, and then like a small link to look for other options in your consent, and I don't believe that that would be accepted for, um, as, a, as a way to give consent. That wouldn't be seen as manipulative, so that it wouldn't be really a, f a free decision of the user. So, and there are, have already been uh, lawsuits are being filed about these, al along these lines. So it will really be very interesting to see what is happening after May 25th. Then, um, perhaps not surprisingly, GDPR will raise the privacy bar for global users outside of the EU. So I think um, GDPR is going to set the tone for the privacy discussion in the world probably for the next 10 years. Um, and I already mentioned that many companies are considering to adopt GDPR um, principles, not just for processing of European data, but to apply those that much more broadly, which I think is an excellent thing and which I would also, as someone who thinks privacy is important, I, I would support. Oh, I want to go back to point one. One of the things that I believe that the enforcement will be really aggressive is that European regulators or Europeans in general you view privacy as a human right. And that, so it's not something that's just commercial or that you can easily negotiate away. And Europeans have been very nervous about what's been happening in the US and so on, about pri with privacy under the Trump administration, um, and have been angry. So they're really taking the lead in the world and they're consciously doing it. They're saying somebody needs to stand up for the people and, and to do all this. So I think they're really fired up uh, to take action. The last point that I want to make is that I believe that privacy engineering will become uh, a very common and necessary specialization within dev teams. Although we don't have yet the, right, the, the good ways to train privacy engineers, I think there's going to be a lot more um, uh, courses and best practices and so on that are going to be produced in the next few years so that this becomes a flourishing discipline for um, within software engineering, that there are people who specialize in this. My recommendation is if you want to pick up the proposal I made before to have a, to have a champion in your teams, take someone who is actually interested in privacy. Don't force people to do it. Take someone who is really interested and uh, then train them up. This is also what I'm trying to do in my own organization. So with that, I'd like to end and open it up for questions. GDPR, is that afraid for the data collected after that it becomes effective, effective or the regulation is up? is applied for the data collected after that the effective date, or it's also applied for the data we have collected before that date? Um, that's an excellent question, because a lot of companies are grappling with this very problem. And um, no, the GDPR applies to the, also the data that have been collected before May 25th. So what a lot of organizations choose is to delete many of those data, so they do some house cleaning. Because the consent, as I mentioned before, the consent requirements are very high. So if you collected the data before May 25th, according to such a high standard of consent, then, you can, then you're allowed to keep processing them after May 25th, um, because then you have the lawful basis for doing so. However, if you don't have uh, obtained, for example, user consent according to GDPR standards, or 
if you don't have another legitimate reason to process the data. So for example, if you're an HR department, you have a legitimate reason to process payroll data or something. You don't need to ask user, uh, you don't need to ask employees for their consent for that. You have a legitimate reason. So you need to find that legitimate reason or else you have to renew the consent. And that's perhaps some of you have received emails. Certainly if you live in the US, you get a lot of emails where, you, where now companies are asking uh, for an explicit opt-in consent, for example, that you can still send them direct marketing and so on. So it affects data collected before May 25th. And uh, the British um, Information Commissioner had said very clearly, either you put your processing after May 25th on a, on a lawful basis under GDPR, or you have to stop processing. And they also said at the same time, there's no grace period or anything, so you should expect to do this right now. Any other questions? OK, then thank you very much. Thomas Sanders-sama, thank you very much. That's it. PM Session 2, Data for Privacy Session.